Released over 15 years ago, Mario Kart for the DS became the fifth installment in the series, and considered to this day by many to be the definitive edition. Along with titles like Super Mario 64 DS, Animal Crossing Wild World, and Metroid Prime Hunters, it helped propel the Nintendo DS's popularity throughout the mid-2000s. It also became the company's entry title into the online gaming sphere, debuting the Nintendo Wi-Fi Connection service. Although quite limited in functionality compared to most online games nowadays, the idea that you could race against three other players from around the world was a revolutionary step forward for Mario Kart and for Nintendo. From a competitive standpoint, this release never quite made it into the spotlight, for probably a diverse set of reasons, however mechanically intricate and input demanding it was known to be. Over the following years, it inevitably found itself in between an awkward transitional period, in which the foundations and infrastructure of what we know of today as the modern esports industry were being laid out. The console wars were also raging strong at the time, and the fact that Mario Kart DS was limited to handheld hardware were further reasons which potentially hindered its competitive appeal on a broader scale. In the year 2008, a Spanish player's entrance into the competitive circuit would ultimately transform the game forever. This is the story of one of the greatest Mario Kart players of all time. Mario Kart DS was released between November and December of 2005 for all main regions. It brought back 16 tracks from past iterations and introduced 16 brand new ones, a missions mode, 8 player local area link up and of course you could connect online. As of September 2020, Mario Kart DS sold over 23.5 million copies worldwide and is the third best selling Nintendo DS game. At the time, like, I didn't think, like, I thought it was fun and everything, but I never expected that I was going to, like, go on this long endeavor of getting really good at it. I had played, like, Super Mario Kart before, Mario Kart 64, Double Dash, I owned all of those. My friend had owned Super Circuit, but I still played his, but I had never owned it. So, like, getting Mario Kart DS was just like getting any other Mario Kart game at the time. Mario Kart I've always been a big fan of Nintendo's games, so Mario Kart was just like the culminating point of the whole Nintendo franchise to me because it's all of the Mario characters together on a racing game. It feels like it was one of the best games uh, back in the day in terms of pure content. Also, the retro tracks. I mean, for having played every single Mario Kart, Seeing a few, well, 16 of the older tracks being remade for the DS, it felt awesome. I lived on a block with like probably like 12 kids. So six or seven of them had Mario Kart DS and we'd go in my garage and we'd play multiplayer. And the multiplayer for that game was phenomenal. You know, you had your own DS, not much lag. The game had incredible mechanics and the tracks were fantastic. You had 32 tracks as opposed to Mario Kart Double Dash, which only had 16 and um, played that game for hours. We'd have sleepovers. We have sometimes, we, we'd like pitch a tent in the backyard and have like eight player matches. It was like the best game ever. Mario Kart 64.com, or more commonly known as the Mario Kart Players page, is a competitive time trials website founded in 1997 by one Kevin Booth, which gave way to sister sites for the rest of the games in the series. Since its original inception, the site has grown to host thousands of players competing for the fastest time trial records and has been considered the central hub of elite tier Mario Kart competition. It is notable to mention that in June of 2012, Cole Gilbert created MarioKartWorldRecords.com, which serves to document world record history on each track and category. At a competitive level, most, if not all of the games in the series abuse the mechanics of mini turbos or more commonly abbreviated as MTs. In the case of Mario Kart DS, the immense difference in speed between a casual player and someone pulling off consecutive mini turbos was soon apparent.
The technique gained an infamous reputation early on, particularly in the online mode, causing major controversy amongst its player base. Many racers learned and benefited at the cost of enduring repetitive thumb straining inputs on the D-pad. Others ended up seeing it as more of a chore that didn't add to the Mario Kart experience. And some gave up altogether, dismissing the game as boring. I did play like with my friends and people at school and it was really fun for a while because you know people weren't as competitive people didn't really know about these tricks but when I fi figured out what snaking was and started doing this to people people thought I was cheating so eventually people just didn't want to play me anymore Snaking, I know, was from the Nintendo official magazine at the time because they had their challenges and they had figure eight circuit 132 and I think I had maybe like a low 136 or high 135 at the time. And I'm like, how on earth can you possibly get 132? But then they said, oh, well, we use snaking. And I'm like, what's snaking? And then like I saw someone else they put it and it was like, oh, just using like your drifts and your MTs on a straight. And I'm thinking, well, why didn't I think of that? Snaking I found out about towards like the end of 2005, like maybe a few months after the game came out. It was my friend who taught me how to snake. Um, there were some people at his school who were better than us at the game and he learned from them how to snake. They sent him ghosts, he sent those ghosts to me. And like over a period of like a few weeks, I ended up beating most of these guys' ghosts. <laughs> it became to that point where I, I, I had learned this forbidden technique and people just thought I was breaking the game so they didn't, they didn't want to play me anymore. And that's what drove me to like look for the players page to find people who were competing in time trials like globally. So yeah, I just pursued it more and more from then on. Snaking was however not exclusive to the DS version, it being usable in Mario Kart Double Dash as well as to a degree in its console predecessor, Mario Kart 64. F-Zero GX for the GameCube also similarly featured a snaking exploit sometimes referred to as Dako. It is widely argued that snaking in Mario Kart DS was so game-breaking it completely ruined the fun for the average racer. And if you were someone who took it up, playing against the right opponent at the height of online play in 2006 was probably regarded as one of Mario Kart's most intense experiences to date. For me, at the very start, it was it, it was clearly uh, purely Wi-Fi that motivated me. Uh, I mean, af after the very first hours, you know, uh, trying training a little bit in Grand Prix, when I got the internet connection to work, um, racing online was the, the one thing that I loved. Instead of spending time with my family, I would just play MKDS online, and I would also ask for internet connection to my neighbors to be able to play MKDS online. It was crazy. Back then, in the early days, there was this snaker emblem that people could have, and I played against a guy that had that emblem. He was three stars, um, and he just torched me. He destroyed everybody. So I went to finding out what was going on, what's happening. So I signed up on the IGN message boards. IGN is like a video game review website, and started posting on the, the Mario Kart forum in there. Uh, a year or so later, I joined the Insider forums, and I guess to know people like Star Wolf, you know, Sean Deere, and, and Husky, Josh Haben, Zip, Egg13, those guys. It was a really cool thing to, to do back then, to play online every day and find good matches all the time on Japanese Continental and worldwide on rivals. Wi-Fi ga hajimete jisso sareta no de Nintendo Wi-Fi connection de shitake. Ma sore o tsukatte yoku furuku kara no rekisen no umai katagata to renshu o shite mashita ne. I still remember the first match I ever had. It was against two players. It was one of them was called Dark Samus 
and one of them was called One Up Shroom. Um, and they both destroyed me basically because I didn't know about any techniques at the time. Like I knew about snaking, but I wasn't any good at it. Also found the players page at the same time and contacted a few players, like top players. I don't know why, I, what I was thinking, contacting the top players. And the first player I contacted was Magic Cooper, a player from Australia. Um, and he had like a lot of what, quite a few world records. So I raced him and me and my friend were racing him at the same time, basically. And he was PRB and he was going across the grass. We had no idea what was going on. Like we were calling him a cheater, asking him what he was doing. We had no idea. For competitive time trials, snaking was not optional. If you wanted to push each track and aim for the fastest possible times, you had to play by this rule. Snaking essentially allows you to maintain a consistently higher top speed as long as you are able to pull off successive mini turbos throughout as much of a track. Within three weeks of its regional release, Japanese players were seemingly way ahead with their time trial records. A website at the time called timeattack.mariokartds.net boasted of impressive rankings, some of which were beating the world records being submitted on the player's page. Many Westerners were questioning whether these times were legitimate. What they were completely unaware of is what Japan had discovered during the short period after release, a glitch known today as PRB, which is short for prolonged rocket boost. PRB に気づいた人と知り合いだったんですね。ミン君って方だったんですけども、日本人の。日本のプレイヤーのミン君って方が PRB を発見したんですけど、彼と知り合いだったので、えー、彼が発見してすぐぐらいですね。発見した1日あと2日あとぐらいに教えてもらいましたね。To make use of PRB, you would have to first get a perfect start boost by holding down A as the two begins to fade during the countdown. And then start snaking almost immediately. This tricks the game into maintaining the perfect start boost through chains of mini turbos. In other words, your start boost, as well as top speed, are permanent or prolonged, as the P and PRB suggests. The main advantage to using PRB while snaking is to be able to cut through off road sections at full speed well into the track. For unknown reasons, you can also achieve this start boost state by mini turboing off the boost pads found on tracks like GCN Luigi Circuit and Wario Stadium. This has come to be known as PRB Restart. It hasn't even been a month, and most of the game's competitive framework has already been laid out for the next decade and beyond. Fast forward nearly three years to 2008. MK Dasher begins his emphatic rise to the top. He wasn't one of the players that I would be talking with the most, but I remember that we had some exchanges and we actually played online too、uh, at some point.、Um, we didn't play a lot, but I, I, I have, a, from that, these early times, I, I, I already had a very positive impression about him as a person. I thought he would be a player that, that comes and goes, you know? Uh, there was a lot of people that would get interested in the game after a few years, and they'd be gone after, after a year of playing or something. I didn't think he, he would stick around because of that.、Um, that was obviously wrong. In terms of level, when I first met him at that time, I remember us racing a few times. I must say that I, I would never have predicted how unbelievably good of a player、uh, he, he would become.、Um, he was good, but he was, I would say, In, in the bulk of good Wi Fi racers of the time, I, I didn't see anything standing out when we raced online at that moment.、Um, and, well, obviously, I missed something huge. I think early on, he was someone that commented on my videos and I like, sort of watched his in return.、Uh, so I did see him quite early on. And it was when he started getting close to world records on certain tracks, even though he was. Like lower rank than I was, that's when I realized that、like, he could actually be a serious threat overall on the charts. MK Dasher actually didn't start as such an all round player. He was actually what we call a, a track specialist on, on Rainbow Road. And his, his Rainbow Road times, I remember, were really good at the time for his rank. He, he had times that were, I think, probably as good or very close to mine at the time when I was ranked, you know. Probably, I think, within the top 20, and he was ranked 
you know, in outside the top 100. And I thought, wow, this is really impressive. It's, um, his times are really good for your rank. And I remember commenting that on his on his video saying, wow, great times for your rank, good stuff, keep it up. But my first um, impression of him was that he was, um, MK Dasher was, was good, but he was just another player at the time. During his first year of real competition, he proved to be good on the beta tracks, where he claimed some of the textured and untextured world records early on. He was particularly good on two other tracks as well, Mario Circuit 1 and Rainbow Road, notably on the former. Having gone from a 39361 to a 38870 in just a month, MK Dasher's rate of improvement started raising some eyebrows in the community. His first world record came on the 30th of November 2008, albeit on the beta Dokken course, which was still untextured at the time. Given how relatively new the competition for beta tracks was, MK Dasher saw an opportunity to pounce with more world records in this category over the months that followed. It wasn't until the summer of 2009 that saw the beginning of a long and ongoing affiliation with one of Mario Kart's most iconic and yet infamous tracks, Rainbow Road. Since we started playing the game, it improved almost 20 seconds due to his innovations. He just grinded and he just kept going. It definitely takes a certain type of person to have that, that will and that drive to set that many records and continually push their own times down. Rainbow Road is, I would say, one of his trademark tracks. Uh, that, I mean, if you tell me MK Dasher, Dasher I, would speak, I would think of Rainbow Road uh, very rapidly as one of, uh, of his, uh, you know, most, uh, in the, the tracks he's been most influential on. When, when we first played the game, there was no shortcut Rainbow Road. We just went around the track and, and we beat it normal. People were trying to find things and there were theories and whatnot <clears throat> because you could still phase through the track here and there and kind of break things, but eventually we, we had the the whole, you know, the jump shortcut or the pipe shortcut as we call it, um, which um, is quite easy to pull off. But more importantly, we had the, I like to call it the Husky shortcut, and I'm sure many old school players do. The, the husky shortcut it was, it was the railing right and it was it was ridiculous you, it wouldn't surprise me at all for you know out of everyone in the top 50 i would say only like the number of players that would have pulled off that shortcut you could probably count on one hand on the 26th of june 2009 he set a shortcut lap time of 35 481 his first successful attempt using the rail shortcut the world record there was knocking. However, his first one on the official tracks came in the non shortcut category, just two days after his shortcut lap personal best, setting a time of 38.036. Another two days pass, and MK Dasher claims the shortcut three lap world record with a cool 151.884. He would improve both times over the following weeks. The track underwent a dramatic transformation, with an old strat concept being finally put to use. It eliminated the need to perform the rail shortcut, pioneered by Husky217, and ended up saving several seconds combined with the pipe shortcut later on in the lap. The end product was not solely the 150 barrier being broken, but incredibly enough, 140 also fell. The fastest Rainbow Road has ever been driven sits at 138.423, digits that any time trial player from Husky's generation would find inconceivable.
I don't think I've ever seen anything quite like that. Of course, partially, in fairness, that's because a new strategy was found, which, like, facilitated that, I suppose. Um, like, if we were still using the old-fashioned rail shortcuts, uh, it wouldn't have gone down quite so quickly. But, uh, you know, it doesn't really change the fact that, you know, he's dominated even when new strategies have been found. And I think it's usually him that found them anyway. MK Dasher was like, oh, new strategy? <laughs> Let me just sub, like, another four seconds off this track. And he just destroyed it. He played that thing for like two weeks and like ripped apart the world records, uh, got it to where it is now. And then as if that wasn't enough, he's like, yeah, let me do a fastest lap with every character. What? He's just putting up ridiculous laps that are like, you know, top five would have been world record with like silly characters, man. Absolutely insane. Absolute madman. Before we had this uh, final shortcut, we had the real shortcut which was taken like once and then three times the, the pipe shortcut, then twice the real shortcut. So you see, the thing is, you save so much time with these shortcuts that, that every single time you hit an extra one, uh, you're able to get a new milestone down. If you're like someone that doesn't know Mario Kart DS that well and you're just watching his world records, you don't really see like the amount of attempts or effort or work that goes into hitting those. The really big shortcut from the spiral past the loop is like extreme, an extremely tight window that you have to squeeze in there. Otherwise you go out of bounds and get replaced on the track. But the fact that he was able to hit it, so first of all, finish so many runs doing these shortcuts and then hit that six out of six is like, real, re it's just really insane. I think just knocking down all of those seconds over a long period of time, you could argue be unoptimized in one portion, sure, but you could also argue that no one pushed themselves enough to really um, accomplish those new standards of uh, implementing uh, newer strategies and really grinding that out. He's basically managed to get the world record and then the world record again 11 seconds faster and, and, and almost all, all the subs in between. And that says a lot about yeah, how, how dominant he has been on this track. Uh, he clearly has... Uh, an, an, an incredible understanding of of its mechanics and of uh, I, I I suppose of the of the of the, the proper way to play, um, which which I wish I, I would have even ten percent of that would have helped a lot at some point. The top ten time, the difference between number one and number ten is ten seconds. That's ridiculous. You can't have ten seconds discrepancy between the top ten. It takes another you know, nearly 100 places to, to cover the next 10 seconds. And then you look within the top five, you know, there's still a four-second difference. Even the, the distance between him and Rupa, who's number two, is one full second. You know, these are just gaps that you just don't hear of. For the rest of 2009, MK Dasher sets over 20 unique world records on tracks like Shroom Ridge, Choco Mountain, and Sky Garden the latter of which was his next pursuit. On the 11th of July, he would set a time of 1.02.267, becoming one of the few players to have completed a three-lap run with the Egg One. Exactly one month later, he captures his first world record outside of Rainbow Road, with a 1.00.766 three-lap, besting the world champion, TB1. MK Dasher has stepped into new territory, graduating from track specialist to serious contender for world records all round. On the 31st of May 2012, Japanese player Rupa sent shockwaves throughout the community, declaring a 1005523 lap. But remarkably, the car choice was Drive Bomber. A change in strategy was applied, cutting the famous cloud shortcut to the left of the beanstalk as opposed to the usual right path. The same concept was applied in the latter section of the track, becoming superior to the Egg One at the time. It took MK Dasher until the 17th of April, 2014, to respond back. Persisting with the Egg One, the record was lowered to 100337, but he wasn't done. Within a week, after gradual improvements, MK Dasher achieved one of the game's most significant milestones, Racing Sky Garden in under one minute.
it was probably like two or three years of him pushing down that time. And uh, he had a like one month where he just kept beating his times. And I remember when he set that 59,990, he is pretty much just barely dodging all these beanstalks by pixels as he maintains PRB. And he's not even taking the tightest lines everywhere. It's all about maintaining PRB so he can just keep it going and keep doing these off-road shortcuts. Because as long as you have PRB, you know, you're good. Well, you need the whole package. You need fast empties, the technique. Um, you need to pull out the shortcuts. You need to do all, all, all of this. And the time that he got is just so solid. It's so ahead of the competition. I drive a lap and I'm like, wow, that was really good. And it's like 20.4. It's not even close. And he's just like doing sub 20s, you know, for fun. I think most players for games also ask for time trailers. We like the, the numbers part of it. So seeing like one and then dot dot zero zero, whatever, but seeing this 59 and no extra thing beforehand precluding that. Honestly, myself, I've, I've never cared about subs so much. I know that a lot of people care about subs a lot. I understand why, of course, it's a testimony to the fact that the game is progressing. And uh, of course it gets a lot of people excited and that's great. I will admit, like, I think speed running to this day probably puts too much, um, gives too much reward for subs of like time and like getting sub like one minute is really, it's just like artificial. Like the time doesn't matter that much. It's just getting faster. We always theorized about it, you know, we said, is it going to happen? Okay, well, we might need to use egg. Can we use pulp? Is pulp possible? Or what about BLS? Nah, not going to happen. Actually, during my GDQ run, I think this was one of the two or three world records that I was saying, like, as I was playing Sky Garden, I was like, anyone watching this right now, you have to go watch this world record on YouTube. Like, go search MK Dasher and go watch that world record. It was really creative to watch how he managed to push his time down and find his way around the track and ultimately uh, push it down from one minute 0.5 by Rupa. So he pushed it down over half a second. He, he did it so quickly too. It's it's insane. I imagine that MK Dasher must be the, the type of person who, who actually goes for these subs and, and aims at them. And it's true that he, I mean, basically I think when he, when he did set his mind on, on, on a target like this, most of the time he he, he accomplished it. Uh, like there's also his sub on, the, for example, I think pitch, pitch circuit, uh, PRB three lap. And it's true when you see that, that he manages to break this, barrier and to achieve that yeah i mean if I, I wouldn't like to be competing against him right now because it would be very challenging i wonder if he'll ever go back to that track and try to try to beat his time or if there's even any motivation to do so because he already got the sub it's such a nice time to say okay that's the pinnacle of this track it's not going to get better than this you know i i don't doubt that it could be beaten 100 percent. i'm sure if mk dasher decides to sit down one day and say hey I'm gonna um, I'm gonna sit down a bit this, a bit this time. He absolutely could, hundred percent. But I don't know if he will. I don't know if he will, unless someone else beats him. MK Dasher's charge for time trial greatness continued throughout the rest of 2009, setting his eyes now on Shroom Ridge, the fourth track in the Flower Cup, one that arguably has MK Dasher DNA written all over. Complicated to time trial at a high level, requiring to drive in between cars and walls for many sections, as well as spacing the mini turbos well enough. The large field of grass roughly 20 seconds in is also PRBable, although extremely difficult even for your average racer. At first glance, it's you know, take off all the all the moving car obstacles, it's probably a much easier track, but then you've got to manage cycles right you know any track that has moving obstacles and cycles that you have to manage automatically becomes trickier it was always so bumpy i had a hard time getting mini turbos on certain portions of the track because there'd be downward and upward slopes and sometimes it would eat my left right left right and i wouldn't get my mini turbo when i thought i would we have most of the america ds tracks as custom tracks in america we and we we play that Pretty scary too, honestly, for at least at the beginning first half of the track for each lap. I'm wrong along the first corner, then the kind of the 
the lone arc into the second and third one, the fourth one by the grass or whatever. Um, that's very scary, also in Mary Kirby for custom track time trials, but nothing compares to the actual game that comes from Mary Kirby DS with that. Out of the blue, on the 11th of August, he would snatch the world record hitting a 138.099, once more diminishing TB1's tally in the rankings. Two days later, it was taken under 138, with a 137.856, a world record which remained unchallenged for more than a decade. It was the second longest lasting world record in any Mario Kart game. 11 years and a global pandemic marked a mere 25 millisecond improvement by American player Max. Curiously, he didn't make use of PRB at all. Max enjoyed a seven day stint at the top of Shroom Ridge, MK Dasher striking back swiftly with a 137.581. On the 3rd of October 2020, something remarkable happened. A sign of innovative brilliance seen time and time again on other tracks. MK Dasher took it upon himself to push for a second lap of PRB. Ridge for me is maybe also one of the main tracks that I directly associate with MK Dasher just because of the, the, the beautiful storyline that there is to it. I mean, uh, when he got his world record at the time, 11 years, <laughs> more than 11 years ago, um, I was still playing uh, on time travels and I was the one competing with him. And I remember spending a lot of hours trying to get it back when he, you know, and trying to improve my own times. and. I must admit that I just didn't manage. Someone breaks a record, he comes back. Like, like, he's done that a lot of times before, like when someone beats his record, he comes back and beats it back. But this time, he beats it with like a completely new innovation. I do wonder if you played it semi-safely, you could do, like, you could extend it to lap three. I think you possibly maybe could, but don't get me wrong, it'd be very hard. I don't know how long he's been, like, knowing about the fact that you could PRB more than one lap on that track, but the fact that he came back and like did it so quickly, that was just, I mean, that that was an eye opener for sure. Like if you were to try to focus more on maintaining PRB in one or two seconds rather than optimal line, you probably could extend it to lap three. You have to make sure that you have the minute trouble last as long as possible without losing PRB but still be fast enough to uh, continuously keep the PRB. And I think that this track is the one that shows the best with that. I remember discussing keeping PRB on Shroom Ridge for more than one lap back in 2009. And I remember even trying it a little bit, but I never, well, I, I, I didn't deem it impossible, but I never went for the push and did it. Let's say the raw record maintains PRB for one, the first lap in the time. And then the newest standard is, is, is like one and a half laps of PRB. I can only imagine if he maintains it for maybe two full laps, he might get like a 136 for sure, I would wager to say. No one had ever thought that this was going to be possible, right? 
you not only have to deal with all of the sharp, tight hairpin turns on that track, but you also have to deal with these moving obstacles, which makes things hard enough as it is. And then to, to take that and then PRB on it for one and a half laps, get the shroom spot down on PRB and then shroom it on the last lap, you basically just, you've got an unfair advantage. No one else can have three shrooms with egg one. What is that? I remember seeing the MK Dasher, he was uh, approaching like 4,000 days on that track. I think over the years, people just sort of left it. Uh, it's kind of the psychology of like, you know, it's a really sort of old record, like a little record that some people liked and some people just left it. It got beaten by an American player named Max and I saw that and it was, uh, I remember looking at the world record website and seeing that MK Dasher's record lasted over a decade. The 11 year world record, um, it's really, really good. His middle lap, it's only like um, 0.15 slower than my lap or something, like 11 years before I did it. The car at the very end, I think it's the blue car at the very end, makes this, this just so tricky, you know? Every time you push even further and further and further, that blue car is even more in the way of the perfect racing line for this track. And that's the trouble, right? It's at the end of your third lap. Anyone who's driven a world record knows that at the end of your third lap, you are shitting bricks. I think that's probably one of the most intimidating things about it. Why nobody really went for it is because you have to deal with those cars at the end and you have to risk it all to beat it. I mean, you can get a great new strat ID and, and you're still 0.5 behind your time from before just because the strat is not optimized. And I think this is where I at least used to stop. I would not um, give in the extra effort to push this new strategy into something that really becomes valuable and that really brings in faster times. And I think MK Dasher always managed to, well, believe in himself and, and just go for it. In a totally different decade, he got this time that was amazing. And then like over a decade later, he's the one that still has the world record. It's a new world record. Like just to see like the gap of his playing time. I think that's like one thing that this shows the most, like he was so good back then and he's still so good now. And he's obviously the only player like that has been like number one at such like different times in history of Mario Kart DS. And this, this world record pretty much represents that. Choco Mountain, an iconic track from Mario Kart 64, was next on the agenda. This is quite a long three lap to endure for a player of any caliber, requiring just as much mini turbo speed as technique. It is almost two minutes of mini turbos being executed non-stop, all the while maneuvering the cart up and down its hills. On the 18th of August 2009, just five days after the sub 138 Shroom Ridge time, MK Dasher sets a new world record, a 146.780. Far from a perfect run, it did however have something which stood out for the lap transitions. He made good use of an MT before the hills at the top of the lap. Whilst in mid-air, you can gain speed by pressing up on the D-pad, performing a technique known as fast falling, allowing the Rob BLS to bounce from the second hill and land cleanly on the third. To the viewer's surprise, MK Dasher did not come up with this. The credit goes to an old school Japanese player who went by the name of Senju, having used it first in his 147.461 former world record, set in June of 2008. This simple yet effective lap transition strategy arguably played a crucial role on the journey to sub in 146 and eventually 145. MK Dash's announcement on Choco Mountain triggered a seismic shift, the likes of which has never been seen before in such a short time period. For 28 days, MK Dasher, TB1, and Matt Utter went to war in one of Mario Kart DS's most enthralling contests.
Great Chocka Mountain Revolution of 2009 had concluded on the 15th of September. In just a few short weeks, the world record dropped by almost one and a half seconds, and the way it was rocked so suddenly did not involve the use of any game-breaking glitches or boundary skips discovered at random. It was purely done driving it in its entirety, with nothing but sheer optimization. A 145-361 is what we're left with, by none other than MK Dasher. I don't know how you can maintain snaking in any portion and going fast on the track from how claustrophobic, how narrow it is. Um, and also hearing, you know, what the 11 records, right? 11 records in 28 days with no major strategy changes a couple years after the fact. Like, you only have that in most games if there's like a, a new glitch, a new shortcut, a couple of new strategies that are put in, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but taking it down, like, it's just funny because like let's say like the, the the trio there all three of them they didn't like really battle that out you know how long it would have taken them to reach that center of over one and a half seconds faster you know what i mean i, I wonder if you had that that coordinated attack on different tracks with like the top level players um how quickly you could defeat a time and let alone bring it down by that much in particular it fell by an insane amount. I remember every time a new video would come out, I'd watch it and be like, holy moly, what is going on here? Like, how are people cutting so much time on a world record all of a sudden? What's, what's happened? To an extent, you know, in hindsight, it doesn't surprise me now that that world record fell by so much because <clears throat> there was just such an improvement in, in the strats that were being used and there was such an improvement in the, in the caliber of the players that were running it at the time that... I don't think there was really anywhere else for it to go other than down by so much. But um, at the time, you know, cutting off that much off any world record in such a short period of time was unheard of. Activity at the top of Choco Mountain would remain mostly dormant for years, with no serious contention for number one. That is, until Matt Utter pulled off a 145-336 improving the previous record by 25 milliseconds. Subsequent, gradual improvements would follow between the years 2014 and 18. The record today stands at 144.353, leapfrogging over Matt Utter's sub-145 milestone, achieved in July of 2015, the first two laps being of a monstrous pace. I played a lot of Mario Kart 64 where the track actually comes from. And it's a bit claustrophobic in the original game itself, but it feels even more claustrophobic, especially the, the little tunnel portion at the first half of the track. Utter randomness. He subs 145. The world record lasts for three or four years. And then MK Dasher comes out of nowhere years later and beats it by 0.6. Not even like a bunch of improvements to get to uh, 144.3. Like he just does it. <laughs> like he beats the world record and shaves off over half a second simultaneously. I was uh, using a much more sort of a strategy that suited my playstyle a lot more, more the sort of spacing, uh, precision based MTs. For a while that worked, but eventually he's found a way to insert enough MTs that. He changed the boost a lot better, and like now I would have to follow some similar strategy to compete. I saw that. I'm like, I'm gonna try that. I'm gonna, you know, try and do that. It's so hard. I can't even get close to doing that. I don't know how to, you're supposed to angle the cart, but I can't get it around the corners. Like for for players like us, that that would feel like a really awkward spot to snake, you know. But when you see him play, he makes it look like it's. A natural thing to do. Kuki came up with those new strats. 
Kugi was using TAS, <laughs> but MK Dashu just goes and does it legit. The fact that someone cheated on that track, like, helped him improve on that track for sure. Then they, that, that he definitely just got a new ideas to how how to optimize that track humanly. The funniest ever MK Dasher moment is Kuki posts this three lap world record. He posts it in the Discord and MK Dasher just posts a rolling eyes emoji where he's like, yeah, okay, sure you did. No way you got that record. And then two weeks later, he just beats it. He's like, man, your task not good enough to beat me. That was just the most incredible thing to me where I'm like, dude, you beat a guy who was cheating and you beat him so bad that if he cheated any harder, he would literally be instantly banned. Watching his time is really um, the, the culmination of just really pushing the game's mechanics within a very small space. Compared to like Mario Circuit 1, where it's PRB Central, almost a full open field barring a couple of pipes. The very top is so much like further ahead of the rest of the competition, like I think a high 146 is still in the top 10 and 147 is like a low 147 is still close to top 10 I think. It's quite scary like how like fast and precise like he is on that track. Around a week or so before MK Dasher hit his first Sky Garden world record, he was comfortably improving his time on the first track of the Mushroom Cup, cutting average finish score. Average finish on the Mario Kart player's page represents the average ranking for all submitted time trials on a player's profile. The lowest the average finish can go is obviously one flat, which would mean to be ranked first for every track. Score can also fluctuate with every week that new times are updated on the site. The track he was chipping away at, and one which would be in the years to follow, become synonymous with MK Dasher, was Figure 8 Circuit. Figure 8 Circuit is by, by definition a reasonably simple track when it comes to shape and when it comes to, I mean you don't have an extremely tricky corner or a set of corners to negotiate. Uh, I mean you, you know what's coming, it's just two, two turns, two turns, two straights. Um, but the extremely difficult part, at least to me, has always been to be steady and to just hold that pace, uh, you know, uh, uh, with, with the PRB on throughout the three laps. And this is really hard to do, even with Egg One, it's already tough. It's probably the best example of needing to balance MT speed with cart control. Like, the, the, I don't think there's a better example of a track that that requires such a high skill level for both of those um, components. At under a minute and a half in length, with a wide open road and two bends of grass, it is the go-to practice arena for players honing their snaking skill. No pipes, changes in terrain, piranha plants, thwomps or such obstacles present here. Just the player and the clock to beat. On the 27th of July 2009, MK Dasher hit a three lap PRB time of 113.798, a mere personal best. It used Luigi's Poltergust 4000 cart as it was the closest in top speed with the Rob BLS, far easier to handle and could just about manage to finish the three laps without the excessively fast MTs the latter cart requires. The first Rob BLS world record on figure eight circuit to have performed more than a lap of PRB was a 113.356 by TB1, set on the 2nd of September 2007. It took only TB1 a couple of hours that very day, until it was blown out of the water with a 112.753. The first sub 113 and the very first to PRB every lap with Rob BLS. Why is this significant? At the time, it was likely regarded as the greatest achievement in competitive Mario Kart DS. The sheer difficulty of keeping a cool head for three whole laps, and knowing the short mini-turbo length of the Rob BLS, the D-pad inputs would have to be performed at a blistering pace. One tiny mistake, a frame too late on an input, and your PRB is gone. Maintaining a good enough line throughout both bends of grass is also a crucial factor in what separates a time that is considered good 
with one that sits amongst the best in the world. MK Dasher bested his personal record with a 113.492 on the 9th of August, days in between his Sky Garden and Shroom Ridge times being achieved. It wasn't until a month later that he decided to take it up a notch. He would join the legendary TB1 as the second person ever to get under 113. Three full laps of PRB performed with the Rob BLS. Roughly eight others have joined the club since then. Unfortunately for MK Dasher, it was not the world record, but it solidified him amongst the entire community as a big challenger for number one in the overall rankings. Come the 19th of April 2010, and we have a new world record holder for figure eight circuit. TB1's near three year domination of the track comes crashing down as MK Dasher sets a 112 317, edging ever so close towards the 111 theorized by players for years. It would get brought down again a year later to 112.045, until finally, after months of relentless grinding and perseverance, on the 24th of February 2012, it happened. I, among all players, was probably one of those that believed that a lot of barriers could be broken in the future. To me, the the, the, the records, as, as we had them, they were weak. I've shown the video to so many people and I've watched it myself so many times. First time I saw 112, I was shocked enough. When 111 comes in the table, like this is perfect. Like no one's gonna beat this. And if someone does, it's gonna be years down the road by a couple milliseconds. That's when you know you've reached a really, really high level in Mark RDS. It's just so striking because you think, okay, well, we've done it. You know, we've, we've done BLS PLB for three laps on this track. How much lower can this track go? Maybe 1.11.5 seems too much, but why not? Like, you really don't have room for errors. As soon as you take one of the turnings a little bit wide, uh, your run or your your hopes of world record are gone. If back in the days you told me, okay, in a few years, in like four years, five years, you're gonna have someone that's gonna break the, the 1.12 barrier. I wouldn't have said that, it's impossible. I'm like, hmm, I can see it, yeah. But you're gonna have to wait a lot of time. The more often you get in a situation when, you know, you're you can get world record and you only have like one turning to go. Uh, I think the, the easier it becomes to handle this situation well. Uh, the stress never goes away though, <laughs> at least for me, it, it never went away. There's, there's always been this spawning heart at the end. You kind of have to be able to, to really skirt close to, to the edge of screwing up your run to be able to actually achieve that time. His lap one ending, he does an extra right mini turbo at the end of the second turn. That sets him up for the flap. Uh, a flap alignment where you get the really good first turn and at the end of the second lap he ends it with a left mini turbo coming out of that second turn which gives you a terrible lineup for lap three which is part of why that record's so impressive to me because he's able to hold it together through the third lap starting with that terrible alignment and you can see like his first turn is by far the worst turn of that run or he's like going super wide and it's really janky. He doesn't want to hit the wall. When you start on lap one, maybe you can be very used to, you know, the pattern of taking the first turning, taking the first straight. But when you come to that same location in lap two and in lap three, you, you know, your card is positioned differently. The emptying starts a little bit at a different timing. Uh, you need to learn that. So you need to get there a lot of times and then you need to manage to optimize that. Some people naturally have the ability to uh, control themselves a little bit more. Um, I mean, everyone is different. Some people externalize their emotions more, some people contain them inside, and some people maybe don't feel them as much. Uh, of course, it's impossible to know exactly how it is for MK Dasher, but at least I think he's, he's probably uh, ahead of the pack um, from, from that side. It was his first big world record. It's a good way to make a name for yourself because it's the first track in the game. And anyone who like watches Mario Kart regularly will know that Usually the first track in the game, like videos of the first track, will get tons more views than like other tracks. 
just because casual players who are looking for insight into the game will just search for the first track basically just to see how the game works and how top level looks. Is 110 even possible for a human? I, I don't know. I, I, I would say probably not, but uh, you know, we've said a lot of things were not possible in this game and you look where we are now and you just kind of think, you can't write this guy out. probably Mario Kart's final boss next to Rainbow Road. Every game in the series features a version of this track, with closed in spaces and angles, thwomps, a rotating log, moving platforms, lava. It leans towards being a more technique based track, as opposed to allowing the average player to mini turbo freely, especially with a wide cart such as the Rob BLS. This is of course, King Koopa's home turf, none other than Bowser Castle. At the very least, like top three most difficult course in the game to play well, especially with the Rob BLS. Rainbow Road, uh, DK Pass, Bowser's Castle. It's so hard to maintain speed on tracks like that because they have so many tight angles and obstacles and stuff like that. The section right where you go up the staircase toward the beginning and there's that like really narrow hallway into the into the circular spinning room, like that's a really tight section there to fit all your mini turbos in. Doing it with Egg One is hard enough. Doing it with BLS is probably like, you have to be perfect. My favorite part is from the spiral hopping around, taking that type and the snaking on the spinning corkscrew thing. Like, well, how in the world are you doing that? Like, you're just like flying almost off the track and you're barely catching on, you're going back and barely catching on and going back and forth, back and forth. You can be like part way down it, release a mini turbo and it just like shoots you off the edge. You hit like a wall almost. And when that would happen, oh my God, it would make me so mad. I and mean, you have to go all the way around and it's a massive, massive time loss. On lap three, the rotating bridge spins the other way. It's spinning clockwise instead of counterclockwise, I believe. To be able to still do mini turbos on that, um, something I've never been able to do. <laughs> I would just be happy if I can get two mini turbos on it. And if I got one, I was okay. I would never be like super risky on it because that would be where my runs would end the most. It's such a technical track. I would say even in one of the most technical tracks of the game where I mean, in 2007 or 2008, I think nobody would have imagined that BLS could do well there. Naturally, Bowser Castle may seem like a pain to most for time trialing, hence the world record history being rather short. To put it into perspective, between the very start of 2007 and the first months of 2010, the world record for the three lap had only been improved 10 times, coming all the way from the legendary German player Sasha Falco X Brauninger. From a 154.363 set on the 30th of January 2007 to 151.872 by TB1 set on the 20th of March 2010. No significant driving tech or strategy developments have taken place, still using the Egg One and fitting in mini turbos wherever possible. Bowser Castle was, for the most part, a free world record for TB1 with the odd challenger along the years, namely Ben Stoneman adding to his tally, and a one-time record holder from Japan, Velzar. MK Dasher would become the third knight to storm the Swiss castle. The key question was, would he be able to fend off a retake? On the 11th of April 2010, he would set a 151.585. That same afternoon, it got improved to a 398, making use of a clever corner cut after the rotating log, which was first applied to the fast lap world record a month earlier. It would take four years for TB1 to re-emerge with a new time, a 151-133, edging ever so close to the sub. Curiously enough, he too would improve his newly acquired world record in the same day, and he would smash it in style.
Activity at the top of Bowser Castle would remain dormant for another while. TB1 fought well in this battle to reclaim what was his, with the Swiss flag planted once more. But the war was still far from over between these two. Seen in a YouTube video uploaded by Matt Utter on the 15th of August, the UK player took the initiative and completed a lap 1 attempt with the Rob BLS, proving that it is in fact possible to manoeuvre it through the track's sharp bends and closed in pathways. The final result was encouraging, setting a 36-117, ranked 4th in the world at the time. This piqued the interest of others, and especially of MK Dasher. Three years have passed since TB1 hit his sub-151 time, and MK Dasher returns to strike back, in what is perhaps one of competitive Mario Kart's most astonishing kart transitions. After nearly 12 years of Egg 1 time trials for the 3-lap, the skill ceiling has been elevated even higher to allow the Rob BLS to take centre stage. On the 15th of November 2017, MK Dasher barely recaptures the castle with a 150-661. You can tell by the driving in this record that he wasn't fully comfortable just yet, especially given the shakiness of the final lap. By the early afternoon of that very day, it's lowered to a 436, albeit with a missed MT, still relatively poor for MK Dasher standards. Aiming to cement his status as the best on this track, he needs to escape TB1's reach. Carrying on playing, yet another new time was hit four days later with a 150-261. A far more composed run, still with plenty of room for improvement, given a below par lap 2. The 149 was now very, very realistic. On the 11th of November 2017, MK Dasher drove an incredible 149.905, raising Bowser Castle's standards of world records immensely. Another one of those things that really impresses me with how he manages to squeeze out main turbos with the elevation changes, like going up the stairs, you know? Like that part, he's releasing them in the perfect spots to have it be as efficient as possible, and then He's on the, the spinning cylinder and he's releasing multiple mean turbos, he's snaking on the cylinder. That that spinning bridge is just, it, it was always the bane of my existence when I played this track. And then uh, I love the shortcut at the end where you just dive off into the lava. Everything from the stairs up until um, the spinning bridge, like so hard with BOS. Especially the, um, the section with the turntable, where you need to like turn like really far right and then get past the form. It doesn't make any sense how he can even do this with the BLS because I have a hard enough time playing this track with the Egg One, you know? And that vehicle is way wider and it has less handling and it's faster. So it makes no sense, but he somehow makes it look easy. We almost get used to it because he, he manages to bring some amazing things like this on almost every single track that he plays. Um, I, to be honest, it's, it's, now it's not surprising anymore for me to see a, a video of an MK Dasher's world record. It's more surprising to me to see that he only gets a, a world number two time or number three time, like on Cheap Cheap Beach, that cannot, cannot take the, both world records. <laughs> this, is, this is the thing that, that, is, that is more surprising. He got a pretty clean run. Like, not perfect, obviously, but super impressive. I feel like I appreciate it more because I've played a track myself, and it makes me realize just how hard it is. It's so difficult to um, pull off a free out with BLS. Use BLS at all in that track. For him to go in with BLS, which has, you know, of course, the much shorter boost length, and to make that cart work on B on Bowser's Castle, even around all those tight corners, it's just incredible to me. Under 1 minute 50 is ridiculous, like, who'd have thought we'd have seen, like, Bowser Castle in the 140xxx range, like, where did that come from? Sub 150 is just a massive accomplishment, and as, as we all know, it's now, it's the longest track in the game. We've taken every single track below 1 minute 50, which in 2006, 2005 would have been unthinkable. Just having the BLS card inside that narrow corridor and just managing to already having it in without hitting the wall is not easy. Then 
chaining empties and keeping a world record pace while going forward with it. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, that gets me also all the time. That section is so difficult with BOS, but MK Dash is so consistent as it from watching his runs. Like, he gets the empties out really soon. I think this track is really fun with Egg because um, it has so much control over that cart. You can get through that section in particular really well. But this track with BLS is, is a different story. <laughs> the first to sub 150, and the first to finish three laps with the Rob BLS. From the snaking on tight paths and lines like the bridge before the rotating floor room, to the corner cuts overseeing lava, the execution of inputs and composure shown throughout the near two minutes of such a difficult track never ceases to amaze. It is undoubtedly a fantastic achievement, and a major highlight of his in a year which saw MK Dasher dominate, with 49 unique world records, the most he has ever set in a single year. I've probably been subbed to his channel since probably 2009, 2010, probably, and uh, he's done some America retasting, he's made some America we custom tracks back in the day, um, I've watched a lot of his collaborations with uh, uh, Mario 64 tasting, especially. I really feel like he's kind of like the, the the portal and gateway for having a lot more eyes on Mario Kart DS in general. I feel um, his videos are very well received; they get a whole lot of views, and um, I I think it's nice to have Mario Kart DS have that on the map with. Such an amazing representative, such as MK Dasher himself. I don't know Mario Kart series, I'm going to tell you this. I don't know Mario Kart series, no, Sai Shuki, Nandaro, Owari Rahen, Keko, Atarashi, Mario Kart, or Data, or Ste, Iku, Raka, de, Tondo, no, by, Hitori, no, Stotoka, Futari, Toka, Ga, Ma, Sekai, Kiroko, Nanko, Mo, Hoji, Suru, Patan, Tiu, no, Sugoku, Oi, Deskedo, Ma, Sono, by, for all of his uh, tool assist accomplishments and all of his custom track accomplishments, it seems like the guy like really knows how to learn things, pick things up, and then perfect them. You know, it, it doesn't even matter what it is. He seems like he's a multi-talented guy. One thing that I can say from watching his videos and his runs is that um, to me, he gives a very uh, effortless impression. Uh, and I mean this as a compliment. Uh, obviously, it's extremely hard to pull out the times that he, he gets. And when I watch his videos, I, I, I don't feel, I mean, it doesn't seem like he's sweating. It, it seems like he's, you know, doing it very easy. It's a bit like Federer playing tennis. Uh, it seems effortless, it seems simple, uh, but it's not. He's able to go fast, both on tracks that require uh, very fast emptying uh, and consistency in, in, in doing these fast empties and also uh, on tracks that are much more technical uh, in which you know you, you, you have to, to get very clean lines. He is really an anomaly when it comes to Mario Kart players as a whole just from his, uh, his sheer skill at the game. I wonder how good he would be at Mario Kart Wii if he like played it all the time. <laughs> Some may say that MK Dasher has more passion for the game or has more drives to get good times for the game than other carters, and this may be true at least in part. Um, it does take a lot of grinding on on the part of a player like him to get these kinds of insane runs, like on SNES, CI2, and on Yoshi Falls, and on Bowser Castle, Rainbow Road, all that. What I do think he has that other carters might not have is just a really high consistency. And to be frank, I don't know where that comes from. Um, I have some ideas regarding the uh, neurology behind it. I think that there are some factors that may make it easier to have a higher consistency. For instance, I think that being left-handed helps because you're, that makes it such that your dominant hand is the one blasting out many turbos. But MK Dasher is right-handed, so that's not a causal factor to the kind of times that we see out of him. He improved his times like very, very rapidly. I remember like seeing him get like a 39 point something in like early 2009. 
on Mario Circuit 1. And like half a year later, he was able to do like three lap PRBs on Figure 8 Circuit. Which was pretty much unheard of at that point. Like the only person who had done that before him was TV1. You know? And like there's there's been a few people who have had like two lap runs and everything, but like no one no one really did three laps back then other than him. And then MK Dasher did it and everyone was like, Who is this guy? To me, MK Dasher is the the Roger Federer of um, of Mario Kart DS. Sometimes, you know, you just kind of got to just sit back and in awe at what he's been able to do over such a long period of time and say, yeah, I mean, that's uh, that's the sign of a real, real great player. That's the sign of greatness. That's the sign of someone who could potentially be the greatest of all time. Someone who probably is the greatest of all time. If you had to um, pick one player as the best of all time, like, it would either be him or TB1, I suppose. TB1 was amazing for his time. But um, MK Dash is like the best by far, like in more modern times. The game definitely wouldn't be the same without him, without all the records that he's pushed for, all the strats because he's innovated, and um, all of his videos and content. It's kind of like the MJ versus LeBron argument. If you compare the two in their primes, which one's going to be better? It's really hard to do because they're different generations and different strategies have evolved over time, different play styles have evolved over time. まあ、一ね、マリオカートプレイヤーとしても、こういうふうに頑張って、まだマリオカートを開拓しようとしている、各国作品であっても、えー、そういうふうに開拓しようとしているっていう、なんか、素晴らしい姿勢を見せてもらえて、よかったかなと思います。The community of Mario Kart DS is really, like, the best video game community that I could ever imagine. It is, um, it's very diverse. There are characters. There are very, very interesting people on one side. There are very calm people on another side. A lot of good memories come from Mario Kart DS, definitely, and that's due to the community. The game itself was great, but、uh, without the community, it wouldn't have been as lasting. It actually just makes me like reappreciate the game for how much complexity it has. It's such a deep game and it has. A great physics engine. I think it's one of those games that's extremely rewarding to play. So I'm really happy that Mario Kart DS is still alive and people are still pushing the game to new limits. The Pokemon games are great for what they are. I love the Pokemon games. I love the Zelda games like、uh, Link Between Worlds. But if we're talking like competitive handheld games, like you're not going to get anything better than Mario Kart DS. You're really not. It's very accessible. It can be taken on the move. Very competitive. Still has an active community. So, anyone out there looking for a good speedrunning game, I would advise MKDS over almost everything else. Most people in our age group that play like Nintendo games or like Nintendo DS games specifically could tell you like multiple memories of themselves playing this game, whether it's with their friends online or anything like that. When I think of Mario Kart DS, I don't think it of、uh, just a game anymore because it's like so many things, it's like the community behind. It's like so many years in contact with something related to Mario Kart DS. It's obviously have been really important because a lot of things that I am now, I can tell it's because of that. Because I got into speedrunning because of Mario Kart DS. It was on the opposite way. I also learned more or less how to speak English because of Mario Kart DS, because of getting in contact with the community. So there's a lot of stuff in that I'm probably not thinking right now that has come because of that. The world record I felt by the time the most、uh, happy about. And I don't think I will ever be as happy as that world record is. It's definitely the Rainbow Road world record with the two la-、uh, rail shortcuts I got. It was like a mixed feeling when I found the shortcut in, two- in 2014. Because on the one hand, I liked to find that shortcut myself. It's like. Like, more credit to me or whatever, because I actually found a new strat by myself that is really huge and it's going to help a lot to play shortcut in Rainbow Road because Rail Circuit was really hard. But on the other hand, it, it was like、uh, taking a lot of value to the 147 because right now a 147 isn't even a good time. I was like super scared when I watched the video again and 
the only reason I think I got it is because I like perfectly landed on it. And also I was uh, I was doing a lot of two lap uh, two rail circuit attempts back in the day when I had a uh, a worst lap in lap two or whatever because I couldn't get a world record. Uh, but yeah, it was like I was super nervous and I was like, okay, okay, this is happening or something like that. I don't I I don't know how to express in words. Countless milestones reached, in the form of being first to sub on a track, first to use a particular cart, and the willingness to innovate and find new strategies to push the boundaries of possibility. The Madrid native rocked the competitive Mario Kart DS time trail scene for years, setting a total of 162 world records along the way, 50 of which are on unique 3 laps and fast laps. His prowess shined brightest when the game reached a mature stage in its life cycle, when world records weren't being improved on a weekly or even daily basis like in 2006 and 7. And he did it on and off, for over a decade, fending off any challengers for the number one spot. MK Dasher is, without question, in the conversation for best Mario Kart DS player to ever touch the game. The thought remains, does he eclipse the rest? Or is there another? Get that. Let it. 